Following on from the breakout success of the Wii and Twilight Princess, the next game in the series brought players back to the cartoony, colourful world of Wind Waker, with a direct sequel for the Nintendo DS, Phantom Hourglass. It was praised at release for its unique gameplay and for changing up the series after the popular but formulaic Twilight Princess, but has since become somewhat forgotten about within the discussion of the franchise. Many cite its touchscreen-only controls as a hindrance to the gameplay, and its central dungeon mechanic was always considered as a chore. The game brings with it little talk of nostalgia or praise anymore. This time I move on to the Nintendo DS generation and sail off into new uncharted waters with The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Pixel Tavern. The Nintendo DS is a particularly special console to me as it's the first one I ever bought with my own money way back in 2005. Yeah, the DS is nearly 20 years old now. When Phantom Hourglass was announced for the system, I counted down every day until its release with pure excitement. Well, it's 17 years later now, let's see how it holds up. As usual, there is full spoilers ahead. Phantom Hourglass first released on June 23rd, 2007, followed several months later on October for the UK. It's also the first title in the series that I was able to follow its full lead up to release while also being a fan of the franchise. The first time it was shown was at GDC 2006, where it was revealed to use the touchscreen for all movement and actions. This was a completely new way to play for the franchise, and was still relatively new in general, as the Nintendo DS released only about a year or so prior. It was quite a daunting prospect though. Playing an entire Zelda game with just the stylus sounded painful, to say the least. But since this was the sequel to my favourite game of all time, I was still ecstatic to play it. Picking up shortly after the end of Wind Waker, which we get a very adorable retelling of in a picture book style complete with memorable songs, we soon catch up with Link, Tetra and the rest of the pirate crew. They're out sailing beyond the Hyrule region of the Great Sea. Sadly, the King of Red Lion's boat is completely gone, and is pretty much nowhere to be found in this game, bar a small easter egg. And beyond the characters you see in this one scene, the aspect of this being a sequel to Wind Waker is very quickly forgotten about. In the opening cutscene we see Link and Tetra try to board a mysterious ship, but Tetra is quickly kidnapped by something and Link is cast overboard to then wash up on a new island. He is soon awoken by an Ocarina of Time style fairy named Celia. I think that's how you pronounce her name, I could be completely wrong. This initially had me excited. Was this secretly Navi? Was there going to be connections to not only Wind Waker, but Ocarina of Time too? No. No connections at all. No references, no callbacks, nothing. Honestly, this game completely wastes its connections to Wind Waker so badly. And after Twilight Princess used its connections to previous games so incredibly well, it's such a shame to see in the next game in the series that there is pretty much no attempt to connect them at all. I was severely disappointed in Phantom Hourglass's story. As a self-contained one, it's fine. A mysterious man named Osius helps guide you on your journey to gather sea charts to explore the world and to regain Celia's memories. Link also gathers some pure metals to make a new sword and defeat the evil creature Bellum. It's a pretty bog-standard story, with no real twists or memorable moments. Osius is secretly the Ocean King, but that is pretty obvious from the get-go. One thing Phantom Hourglass does have going for its story, though, is Lineback, a new character in the series who joins Link on his journey, but not really as a guide character or even a companion. He's more just there to drive the boat and, well, just be an asshole. You initially save him from the Temple of the Ocean King, more on that later, and he is completely ungrateful. But through happenstance and the convincing words of Osius, he reluctantly agrees to drive Link around to each island. He's argumentative, cowardly, and pretty useless. But somehow that's also what makes him such an interesting character. You never learn too much about him, but still just enough to make him intriguing. Such as discovering his ex-love interest Jolene, a very angry pirate who is after him for stealing her treasure, but who also seems to secretly want him back. Although Linebeck is, of course, too dense to realise that. And although he always comes off as cowardly throughout the story, he does end up saving Link in the final moments and shows he does have some bravery after all. 
His character interactions are also always enjoyable to see, from his bickering with Celia to his utter distaste for basically everyone and everything besides his boat and treasure. He solidifies himself as one of the highlights of Phantom Hourglass and as one of the better characters in the series. So that's the story, but what about the gameplay? Well, Phantom Hourglass and its sequel Spirit Tracks are quite unique in the franchise. Coinciding with their unique control scheme, there's also a bit of a different flow to the gameplay than any other 2D or 3D Zelda titles. It's mostly structured the same as a traditional Zelda with X amount of dungeons and side quests surrounding them, but with how the world map is laid out here and the Temple of the Ocean King, the pacing is a bit different and the controls make for a unique blending of the two classic Zelda styles. As mentioned before, all actions are controlled by using the stylus. Buttons are only used for shortcuts to different menus, and there's a secondary option for using your item. You attack by tapping or swiping the stylus across enemies, and you move by either tapping interactable objects or by holding the stylus to the point you want to run to. Even to use your items, you just tap an icon on the screen or use either of the bumper buttons. Then of course is the sailing mechanic. This was done in a sensible but fairly dull way. At any time while aboard Linebeck's ship, you can draw out a path for the boat to travel. It will then follow it with pinpoint accuracy, freeing you up to control the camera, fight off enemies, and once again jump over obstacles. Both Wind Waker's boat and this sailboat can jump. Let's not question it. It's a fun idea, but perhaps due to the console's limitations, there are never enough enemies or things to do. With Wind Waker's sailing, you were always controlling the ship, and frankly, the beauty of its graphics and the potential of new things to discover all the time made the sailing fun, at least for me and some other people. The sailing here, though, isn't backed up by much to discover, as most islands are already chartered for you, and the graphics don't really keep you interested. This leads to a mechanic that works, but ultimately feels too empty, and with how the map is used, four quadrants that are only accessible via one entrance to each, meaning if you want to go from the top left quadrant of the map to the top right, you have to go down, across, and back up to reach it due to the environment. It's all very boring and repetitive by the end. One other thing on the controls, to many people, this control scheme was too uncomfortable or awkward for them to use. For me though, I found it to be pretty good. When I first played the game on the original DS, I found the controls to be smooth and even enjoyable. I still preferred traditional controls, but considering this game's 3D environments, I felt it worked better than the D-pad would have. Replaying it for this video, I used the Virtual Console version on the Wii U, and although I found it a little less comfortable and precise than I remember, I still found the controls pretty much fine to use. I have found though that I do adapt to most controllers and control schemes pretty easily, never really struggling to use any controller bar some initial issues with mouse and keyboard. So I understand that I may be in a minority of people who get along with this control scheme. One thing the touchscreen controls allow for though is some great item usage and puzzle design. One of the highlight items is definitely the boomerang. You can fully control the path it will take based on the route you draw. This allows for the best use of the boomerang in any Zelda game for puzzles. It doesn't do anything particularly new over previous titles, but it is the most satisfying to use of any in the franchise thanks to the complete freedom of control for it. Bomb Chews also get a similar treatment in that you can fully draw out their path. This does lead to some fun timing based puzzles where you have to lead a Bomb Chew to a button while you run through the door it will open for a short period of time. It's definitely the best use of Bomb Chews in the franchise as they remove the awkward side of using them in the N64 games, where the slightest mistake would mean wasting the item. Other items are much less cleverly controlled though. Bombs you just tap a spot to throw them, the shovelers just tap to dig, and the grappling hook is just tap where you want to grapple to. However, at least with that one, it is used in unique ways, such as attaching two posts together to tightrope across them. The items are used very well here, even if the way they are controlled is fairly basic. With seven items in total, each one gets used frequently and creatively throughout the roughly 20 hours of gameplay. But there is one more item that only the two DS games truly take full advantage of. And surprisingly, it's the map. You can draw and write directly onto most dungeon, island, or sea maps, and this really makes for unique puzzles in the franchise that would only really work on the DS. A lot of it is memory or pattern based, but it surprisingly never gets overused. Being able to write things down in game whenever I liked was reminiscent of how I would sometimes write notes in the back of game manuals to remind me of secrets or codes. It gives off a nice nostalgic feeling, and although the puzzles it allows for are not exactly difficult, it's still fun, and it would be good to see it return in a future title somehow. Although without a touchscreen always being available to the player, 
I don't imagine it ever will. The dungeons otherwise are very strong. They're on the easy side of the franchise, nothing really had me stuck for any amount of time, but the pacing of puzzles and the variety of them really allows for some fun dungeon designs that are mostly focused on traditional brain teaser style puzzles than traversal or environmental ones. A key highlight in one of the dungeons for me was getting to roll around as a Goron, and then getting to use them and Link to fight the boss of that dungeon by just tapping a button to switch between them. Sadly, what does let the dungeons down though, is the aesthetics. They all look very similar, and that look is very bland. The colours and hazards change in the general theme of them, but it makes little difference to the actual feel of the dungeon, meaning they all just blend together with nothing really memorable about any of them, which also extends to the overworld and the islands as well. There is one dungeon that stands out, but it's sadly not for a good reason. If you have heard of this game before, you have probably heard of the dreaded central dungeon, the Temple of the Ocean King. Let's start with the bad side, which ultimately is that it's very boring. Returning to it several times gets old, and despite the fact that the dungeon is aesthetically different from the other ones, it's still very boring to look at. There's also the fact that it's very slow and tedious in its pacing. The main issue is though, that on most occasions that you return to it, you repeat areas and puzzles that you've already done. The game does thankfully open up shortcuts through them each time you return, but they are minor shortcuts, maybe skipping a puzzle or two. But this doesn't fix the issue of the boring look and the pacing, which is ultimately such an issue due to the recurring enemies exclusive to this dungeon, the Phantoms. They are based on the Dark Nut style enemies from previous games, with a few twists on them thrown in. But what makes them annoying is that you cannot kill them for 99% of the game. You can only avoid them, and if they hit you, they reset parts of the room, meaning you have to redo the puzzles you've just done. You also lose precious time within the dungeon, which is where the Phantom Hourglass comes into play. Whenever you are outside of designated safety zones in this dungeon, a timer will count down. When it runs out, you take damage until you reach game over. This is never really an issue for experienced players, but I imagine less experienced players, one of the DS system's main audiences, found this to be very annoying, and it was ultimately just not a fun mechanic overall. Especially since the phantoms move very slowly, so a lot of the time you are just standing there waiting for an opening. So what about the good side of the dungeon? Well, as with the rest of Phantom Hourglass, the puzzles are very strong here. Again, not particularly difficult, but there is a lot of variety and unique puzzles that are fun to do. The issue of course being that you have to repeat them several times throughout the game without any changes to them whatsoever. However, one puzzle in particular which you only do once is pretty great. This puzzle caught many people out, including me the first time I played it. You need to get the details of one map on the top screen onto the bottom touch screen. Do you tap the screen, draw the icon? No, you have to close the DS to press the maps together and then reopen it. It's so incredibly simple, but it is still one of the most clever puzzles in the series. The simple act of physically working out the puzzle in a real world movement is something I don't think I have ever seen done anywhere else or since. Sadly, this is not something that happens often in Phantom Hourglass either, but it's still such a memorable moment for me. One last thing on the dungeons is the boss fights, and although the mini bosses are basically non-existent, mostly just being replaced by basic enemies, the main bosses are pretty great. Some key highlights for me are the third dungeon boss fight against a giant crab creature. You control Link on the bottom screen as usual, but there is one issue, the boss is invisible. In order to defeat him, you have to watch the top screen too, which is from a first person perspective of the boss as he charges towards Link. From watching the screen, you can time your attacks to stop it in its tracks and fight back. It's a really fun and once again unique fight that takes full advantage of the Nintendo DS setup. Almost every boss in the game does something unique like this. Even the one that doesn't, the co-op fight with Link and Agoron, despite not using the system feature specifically, is still a fun fight and unique from the mechanics it uses. The final boss uses the dual screen setup in a good way too. Not as strongly as the Invisible Crab fight, but still in a way that leads to a fun and challenging final battle. Finally, there is the presentation. Graphically, the DS does as good of a job as it could here. It was never going to be able to do Wind Waker's art style justice due to the lack of power, but it still looks good for the time. Link and other characters are still expressive and full of character, and although the strong use of lighting and colour is missing, you can still see the connections to Wind Waker's art style, and it runs pretty smoothly as well. Where Phantom Hourglass sadly does falter though, is in its music. For me, there is one memorable song in the whole game, the fantastic overworld theme. It's not as good as Wind Waker's, but you will still have it stuck in your head for days after hearing it, and you won't mind at all. The rest though, 
is unfortunately a low point in the series. Every dungeon, including the central one, uses the same music. Most islands have the same music, all houses have the same music, and most of the songs outside of that are remakes of Wind Waker tracks or from other Zelda games. Hardly anything stood out for me here, and the remakes of tracks are mostly of lower quality than their originals due to the system it's on. It's not a terrible soundtrack by any means, but compared to other games in the series, it's completely forgettable. The composers Kenta Nagata and Toru Minagishi have worked on many other Nintendo games, including other Zelda titles, with great results. So I get the feeling this wasn't a talent issue, but either more of a hardware constraints issue, budget issue, or just a lack of direction for the music. Overall, Phantom Hourglass still holds up pretty well today, 17 years after its release. The controls, although uncomfortable after a while, are still smooth and intuitive to use. The story, although basic, still has enjoyable characters, and the presentation holds up pretty well on the small screen it was intended for, even if the music lets it down. That is the problem with Phantom Hourglass though, it has a lot of positive points about it, but everything comes with a caveat that brings it down. On my journey so far replaying all of the Zelda games, this is one of the least enjoyable ones for me. It's by no means a bad game, I still had a lot of fun playing it, but it just wasn't to the level of enjoyment I experience in most of the other titles and it's so disappointing to see how it barely references its rich Wind Waker lore and doesn't expand on it at all. There was hardly a reason to even say it's a sequel beyond the pirates and Tetra being in it. Still, as with any Zelda game, it's definitely one any fan should play, and although it's probably not one you will return to often, it's still fun, with some great puzzles and its own unique style. And there you have it, Nintendo's first attempt at a fully touchscreen controlled Zelda game with Phantom Hourglass. Despite its flaws, as with every other Zelda game, it still holds up pretty well today. I also feel it was the first attempt to take the series in a slightly different direction. And although it's one of my least favourite games in this franchise, and it wasn't exactly the sequel I wanted to one of my favourite games of all time, it still has a lot to offer. Its sequel though, is one of my favourites in the entire franchise. Next time we move on to... Another sequel to the Wind Waker timeline for the Nintendo DS, with tons of character, playful ideas, and a great story too. Zelda dies in it. Well, sort of. Next time it's all aboard the new Hyrule Express with the Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks. Thank you very much for watching, my name's Phil and I'm the creator of the Pixel Tavern. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more videos on Zelda and beyond. Click the like button and leave a comment on your experiences and thoughts with Phantom Hourglass. Did you pick it up on release date? What do you think of the touchscreen controls and do you feel it wastes its Wind Waker lore? As usual, if you want to see more of my videos, there are more on screen now. Until next time everyone, thank you very much for watching.